Operation Exodus Mississippi. What is OEM? It is the only real solution for descendants of slaves born in America. The original Mississippi campaign, anything else is fraud and will not work. It is the process of bringing into reality the promise land that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke of. It is simply inspiring the so-called black residents of the state to take advantage of their voting power, having a large population to take control of the political systems, laws of their state to benefit themselves, of which brings them power, power they never had before. OEM has nothing to do with religious, personal, or political beliefs, just wanting to make life less oppressive in this geographical area so Blacks can feel safe and operate with less resistance due to racism, forming a type of safe haven sanctuary state for Black people. OEM doesn't advocate trying to force the populace to do anything they don't wish to do, but offer advice and suggestions to improve their state for all citizens, regardless of race, creed, color, sexual orientation, etc. Some of the benefits of OEM could be, one, as a state, you could finally request reparations due to the enslavement of our ancestors from the federal government. Being such, monetary or other awards will not be going to individuals or groups, but a state now in control that benefits this people to help build what this people need to act like true, free, liberated, as well as equal citizens of this nation. Two, having control of the governor's mansion, you can control the state national guard, as well as all law enforcement of the state. Three, create a different way of living among the people to alleviate homelessness and other poverty, requesting the citizens more modesty, opening up more jobs, more time with loved ones. Four, or for true rehabilitation to those in criminal systems so monies on jails can go to more beneficial purposes. Five, state can request the federal government to release all political prisoners in federal custody or those forced into asylum in foreign lands to be returned to or handed to Mississippi so they can live out the rest of their lives in dignity. Six, Mississippi will become a true work state where every man, woman, and child can say they had something to do with the success of their state instead of credit going to a select few. Seven, being an agriculture state already, we can specialize in the production of pure organic foods that is good for our citizens, also can be exported to other states and around the world, having a want for cheaper organically grown food products. Eight, success of OEM will become the blueprint and example, having not enough room for all who now wish to move. So our eyes must be set upon perhaps Alabama, Georgia, and the like. Nine, a state can function independently from the federal government forming relations and deals in foreign lands like Africa to benefit the state and nation. The so-called black people of America have never had true power that others respect. But by doing this, we will get the respect and power we have never experienced. And the doors that will open due to just taking control of your life, we can't imagine. Please be reminded, if not for the domestic terrorism targeting black people of the South, and the federal government refusing to protect its citizens, forcing them to flee. This OEM campaign probably would have been made a reality generations ago. So all you and I will be doing is the work our ancestors wanted to do, but couldn't do due to domestic violence from other citizens. Join and organize Operation Exodus Mississippi today or become a supporter.
Okay. All right. Let's see here. Okay. Set this up. All right, okay, let's set this up here. Mm. Ooh, okay, I guess we can get this party started. Mm. In the name of my ancestors, peace forever and always, and welcome to another edition of what uh, I call the Realities Temple on Earth Internet Ministry. I am the gatekeeper or the host of this program, known here on social media, wherever you may find me. I am known as the mighty, mighty, mighty. Mm. And you're snubbing up seven. I am your soul brother, number one. All righty then. This is the uh, last Sunday of 2018. Yes, 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 it is. It is the uh, last broadcast for this ministry for 2018. And I hope that uh, all of you enjoyed your time with us this 2018. We've done a, a, a few things here. It's been rather interesting. I started the year uh, chasing uh, one of the sisters from In Vogue. That was, that was sort of fun. And now we are embarking on this journey this campaign uh, that is called Operation Exodus Mississippi. And hopefully this time next year, we will have something really nice to report, some type of progress in relation to that campaign. I want to first apologize because I am so sleepy. I should really be taking a nap. I should really be laying down, but I felt sort of good when I decided to put this, uh, this out into the, into the, uh, into YouTube land that I wanted to make a, a live today. And some of you, whether it's 10 or 20 or hundred or, or just one person, when you put that out there and you come here, then I think it is only right that if I am not sick or dead, <laughs> I should come here and uh, talk with us. And I am by myself today. And I think for many of you, 
you want your brother by himself sometimes. It's nice to have a little company, but you come here for the voice of the Realities Temple on Earth. And I am that voice. I'm the one that you subscribe to. And although others may be interesting to add on to the conversation, you come here because of what your brother wishes to offer us. And this is not to be arrogant. This is not to be all high and mighty. This is simply the truth. It is simply the truth that uh, many of us back in the day, we were fans of the Jackson Five. But after a period of time, it seems as though little Michael Jackson stood out. And even though we love Tito and we love Jermaine and we love Marlon and the brothers, we had a little something extra for Michael. And I guess there's nothing wrong with that. The only problem with that is when we, who all this attention is given to, when we begin to believe we are more than what we actually are. And we become arrogant and we believe that we're special and we're divine and we're greater than those who admire us. I am not, and I want to make very perfectly clear, I am not greater and better than anybody that comes on this platform. I am not greater, better, or smarter than anyone who is listening. I'm not, look, I am not better than the troll that comes and leave negative comments. I'm not better than the troll and those who are negative and those who hate and wish you bad and you've never done nothing to these individuals. I'm not better than nobody. The only thing I am is a little brother who have had experience within a problem and I wish to bring that experience and a solution to that problem to those who suffer what I suffer and what I go through day in and day out. I apologize for being a little sleepy, but as usual, when I get started, I can usually burn that sleepiness off. I did not want to disappoint you by not being here today. Um, we are gathered here today. <laughs> We're gathered here because I wanted to make a response video to our brother Ben, who also was making a response video to young Pharaoh. And young Pharaoh has a little clout. You know, young Pharaoh has 100,000 subscribers. A lot of people no young Pharaoh. So when young Pharaoh speaks, people listen. <laughs> and young Pharaoh put out into YouTube land that the nation of Islam does not like kinky hair, that the nation of Islam does not like broad nose and thick lips. And the nation of Islam teaches that the reason why your eyebrows is straight and the hair on your head is kinky is, is a sign of rebellion. It's a curse. And of course, that's not the first time we've heard of something like that. We've heard, we hear the same thing, I believe, from the Hebrew Israelites that we are a cursed people and we need to get right with God and things of this nature. So I wanted to just put my little two cents in on that. Even though it's redundant, it's, it's redundant, it's, it's redundant, and we're having these conversations over and over again. Who killed Malcolm X? Did Farrakhan have something to, to do with the murder of Malcolm X? Do the Nation of Islam teach against Africans? And, you know, these redundant 
conversations that we have over and over, the black men arguing with the black women and y'all talking about the same topics over, over and over again, Cynthia G's weave and whoever, Sinetta is a, is a Uncle Tom agent. We have these same redundant conversations over and over again. And we have learned how to rehash the same old, same old over and over and over again. The same stuff, just a different way of saying it. The same stuff, except a different way of putting it. You would think that we would get sick of it. It's like eating the same food every day. Uh, if you are stuck on an island and the only thing that you have to eat every day is coconuts, it just gets so boring. It just, what we have in the day? Coconuts. Damn, that's what we had yesterday. What are we going to have tomorrow? Coconuts. <laughs> Same stuff. I am subscribed to over 300 persons. And it's the same stuff, regurgitated, the same stuff over and over and over again. And the reason why many will come to this video is because of the title, because I'm talking about the Nation of Islam and uh, young Pharaoh and things of this nature. We just want to gossip and we want to run our mouth and we don't want to concentrate on serious issues. I'm doing my best to stir the conversation, whether it's negative or positive, to get us to speaking about this Mississippi campaign. I don't care if it's negative or positive. Talk about it. Start the conversation. But we would rather continue the old stuff. What Marcus Garvey did. What Malcolm did. Have Miss Sister Harriet Tubman and go what they did in Kemet and thousands of years ago. That's where our minds is at. Where do you think that you're going to go when you can't leave the past, you're not even in the present. So it is very clear, you don't have no idea about your future. So basically the so-called Negro, the descendants of slaves born in America, the african Americanists, the no matter what you call, call yourself, we have no idea of what is a, lies ahead in the future. Some of you barely can get up to go to work tomorrow, which is in the future. Peace to, to, to you, Syrian. But uh, we keep doing the same thing over and over again. And Syrian says, there are no new things in this world and God just recycles everything. We're not even recycling. We're not even recycling. We're saying and doing the same thing over and over again. That's not recycling. Recycling is able to take something that is old, using the material that is old, and you change its form and make it into something new or a new version of what was old. That's recycling. We're not doing that. We continue to become obsessed with the past and what what, what we done yesterday. We barely know what we're doing today and we dang sure don't know what we're going to do in the future. And those who have no vision for the future is doomed. So we need a, a conversation. So we need a, a, a conversation. We need to begin a conversation. How you doing, Donald? Donald says, what plans do you have as a start for the campaign? The first plans that we have is simple promotion. Promotion, you have to get the people to talk because the people cannot act upon what they don't know. So it's about promotion. It's about getting the conversation. You can't do nothing else you can't get support if people don't know you exist. How you doing, Donald? 
and Syrian. Oh man, I got to shout out to, to uh, Facebook. Matter of fact, let me check my Facebook real quick, brothers and sisters. Give me a second here. I want to make sure things is going all right. Okay, brother Gary is in the uh, in my Facebook. What's up, brother Gary? What's up, brother Gary? He's in the uh, in my Facebook. So I just want to make sure everything is running correctly before I get into this talk here. Hold on a second here. Matter of fact, okay. I apologize. Please bear with me real quick. I'm trying to set this thing up here. Okay. Thank you. I didn't want to uh, disappoint us because I'm telling you, I am. And Brother Gary will bear witness, you know, our occupations that we've chosen to do. It's, it's <laughs> makes you really fatigued. But I don't want to keep us long. I should be able to skate through this very quickly. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Brother Donald. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for those in the chat room. Thank you uh, to those who are listening. Thank you for those who are in, in, on Facebook. Uh, face, <laughs> see, I'm tired. Thank you to those who are on Facebook and all of you who will view this, uh, this presentation uh, at a later date. Um, I would like for you to do in the description box, I would like for you to, to uh, subscribe to my uh, assistant minister, Brother Talib, subscribe to his channel. And I also would like for you to subscribe to and support our sister, Sister Noble, Sister Noble and Brother Talib. Their information is in the description box. So before you leave, make sure that you subscribe and support our brother and our sister. And like I said, this uh, particular topic is so redundant. But I'm going to, I mean, I guess I have no choice. Y'all like redundancy because we don't want to share this information. We don't want to talk about this campaign which is really the most important thing that I can think of that we really can do. It's not redundant. It's a lot to cover. It's a lot to talk about. And it's more than about me because you can bring out the, the kinks. You can bring out the error. You can bring out, help bring out the real plan to make it a, it a, a, a success because it can be a success. It can work, but it can't, work based on me it has to be a us it has to be a team effort it has to be a national effort and that's a lot of work to do that's a lot of conversation that's a lot of talking that's a lot of salesmanship to a lot of people so the first priority here is simply promotion Promote, promote, promote. Uh, I'm looking at newsletters and uh, what they call that? Those little, uh, those little uh, notations that you send to news agencies and send uh, newsletters to churches and whatever we have to do in order to get the people to talk. I'm going to have to send out some DVDs to certain people and just get to 2000, the beginning of 2019 is about work, but I'm not going to do it by myself. So all those who are associated with, uh, with me, you know, it's about work. We got to promote. Believe me. Once we get this going, you're going to be so proud of yourself. The benefits. Woo, man. We just don't know. But just to break up the monotony, 
before I get into a redundant subject, <laughs> it's, it's redundant. I did want to talk about real quick. I saw an article and I want to send out uh, props to the country of Liberia. And as many of you know, Liberia was started by a group of our ancestors that actually came from these shores. And I don't know exactly how they end up on the sore shores of Africa somewhere, but they were able to create what we call Liberia. And uh, prior to the Mississippi campaign, I did come before us and I suggested that we should help Liberia. Out of all the African nations, I don't know why they never talk about Liberia. Because Liberia, since they, since they do come from us, they would have more in common with us than any other African nation or any other nation on the planet. Because those people, those are the descendants of us. They are our actual relatives. And of course, like any nation, they are having their ups and downs and they're trying to, 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 to do, you know, trying to survive. And some of us that don't have a pot to piss in, we want to uh, say negative things about Liberia. And we want to put our, our relatives in Liberia down and blah, blah. That was created by white people. Uh, Liberia, okay. Liberia was created by white people. Um, where do you live? You actually live with the white people, <laughs> right? They are Africans. They are Africans. They are generations removed from the United States of America. They are actually on the continent. They have a country that's on the African continent. They are Africans. You holler and scream, right, okay. Thank you, thank you. They were was created by former slaves. Thank you, Don. They are actually on the continent. Here you are talking about you're gonna go to Africa one day. I'm gonna, they are already there. And they may not live as good as you as you might want to live, but they have been doing that for a long time now, for generations. And Liberia is already established. So if you are so smart and you got so much going on, why couldn't we take our money, our resources and our talent, since y'all so blackity black RBG nation and all, go to, a, go to your people in Africa and help them. You won't do it. Because see, some of uh, see, because the reality is some of y'all just fake. You don't want to do nothing. I don't, I don't care what nobody presents. I don't care what kind of solution. I don't care what nobody puts on the table. You don't want to do it, especially if you think it's going to work because you're not really interested in going to no Africa. You actually enjoy getting up, doing a nine to five, going to work for a racist. You don't mind your sons and your daughters taking a chance out in the world being shot down by some racist cop. You don't mind living in a gang-infested environment where, where some of our people who have gone savage, they will shoot you down. You don't mind living in this type of environment because actually you will really are afraid to be free. You actually are. You are because you really don't know what that is. Sounds good. I want to be free. I want to be liberated. It sounds good, but you really don't know what that is. And it really scares you. Be look, because, mm. see, it, it reminds me of a lot of children who get sick and tired of living under the roof of their parents. But at the same time, they scared to leave home. Now, some of y'all, some of y'all left home at an early age, some of y'all left home at 14, 15 years old. You got tired of your parents' home or wherever you was living, and you went out and did your thing. 
But the majority of us, we aren't, we ain't gonna do that. Cause there's a scary world out there. How you gonna take care of yourself? How you gonna eat? Where you gonna live? It's a lot of questions. And see, that's what really scare you. Because you talk all that pro-black stuff, but in the back of your mind, how, how I was gonna make it without white folk? That's what you're scared of. You can talk all that nation of Islam stuff you want, all that Hebrew Israelite stuff all you want. You can talk all that crap all that you want to, but the bottom line is you, you are scared. What you gonna do? Because you go out on your own, you can't blame the white man no more. No more blaming the white man. It's all up on you. The nation of our Liberia cannot continue to blame the white man. It's all up on them. And building a nation, starting a country is not an easy thing. So for them to survive all these years, coming from slavery, what did you say, Don? Liberia was created by former slaves. What you expect from a slave? So many of you, a Liberia a flag look almost like the United States. And what you think? That's all they know. So they base their country on what they knew, which was living here in the United States. That's what happened. And if we want a history lesson about Liberia, I think Syrian is giving us a, a history lesson. <laughs> you know, uh, on Liberia. Syria says that the native Africans defeated the free slaves in Liberia, okay? I don't know all that history. All I do know that we do have a, a connection to, to those people. That I know. We don't have, there's none of you can show me a direct connection to Ghana or Somali or the Congo or South Africa, you cannot show, or, or Kemet, you cannot show us a direct connection. We have actual relatives, we have people that come from us that's in Africa on that continent. Again, if we so smart and we know so much, why start from trying to start from scratch? Why don't we, it would be much easier to just simply help what is already established. But see, the bottom line is you don't care nothing about Operation Exodus Mississippi. You really don't care nothing about Liberia because you are scared of leaving the white man. Because when you fail, you don't have no, nobody to blame but yourself. And you want to be able to blame somebody. Well, if it wasn't for the white man, you, that's what you want to be able to say. The white people didn't let me do this. The white people didn't let me do that. But see, when you leave your mama house, your daddy house, and you go out on your own, you can't blame them for nothing. It all, all the responsibility, everything falls out, falls to you. And that's what the so-called Negro, the descendants of slaves born in America, that's exactly what we are afraid of. Y'all talk tough. Going to Africa, I'm building a nation of my own. Y'all talk a lot of good. I mean, it sounds good, but you're not real. Because if you was real, we already have a place to go, Liberia. If you was real, then a first step is Operation Exodus, Mississippi OEM. That's the first step. I have placed the full lectures of this campaign on Facebook and YouTube and many places. And I don't get no, I don't really don't get any comments except by some silly folks, but I really don't get comments where we can start a conversation. People are silent. People are silent because it's real. It can be done and you are scared. You are scared because if you fail, you can only blame yourself. You want to be able to blame the white man. You want to blame the Arabs, the Arabs in your community, the Chinese and the Koreans in your community. You want to talk about all those who come into your community. That's what you want to talk about. 
You want to be able to blame somebody. You don't want to accept the responsibility for yourself. So you can fool some other people, but you can't fool me. I know what your problem is. You scared, but that's all right. There's nothing wrong with being scared. It's a scary thing to leave out of your comfort zone. That's natural. But look how you feel. How do many of y'all feel when you leave your mama and daddy house and you get your own apartment? It's not the best apartment in the world. It's cheap. You got rats and roaches running around, but it's yours. Remember some of y'all, the first car you ever owned in your life? All beat up and run down. But it's your car. That's my raggedy car. That's my raggedy house. It belongs to me. Out. It's mine. Nobody gave it to me. And you feel proud because you earned it. It's mine. Nobody gave it to you. And as time goes on, your car gets better. And your house gets better. You become better. Your food gets better. But it's because of your hands, because of your work. And you feel proud of it. Nobody gave you nothing. Mama didn't give me nothing. Daddy didn't give me nothing. And even it gets to the point where even God don't do nothing for me. Because I learned. I learned from my father how to take care of myself. God makes everything on this planet able to take care of him or herself or itself. Do you think that for some reason God skipped us? We should be able to do the same thing as any bird, as any deer, any raccoon. So let us begin this conversation and get our people. Let's promote, promote, promote OEM, Operation Exodus Mississippi, because nobody can act. Nobody can make a choice about something they don't know. This conversation of Operation Exodus Mississippi will never be a redundant conversation. <clears throat> That's right. That's right, Don. Look inside the God inside of you. It's not in the sky. It's you. Even your scripture tell you the kingdom of heaven is in you. It's you. Excuse me here. But I wanted to say quickly, as far as Liberia was concerned, I saw an article, and I believe the president of Liberia is some is a is a brother, brother named uh George. What is it? Let me make sure I get that right. George Way, George W E A H. And what he wants to do, and I believe they are not wanting to do it, but they are actually doing it. They are offering free education to their citizens. College. College universities in Liberia will be free to the people. Public universities will be free to the people. Isn't that a good thing? Can you understand? Can you imagine what Liberia could do if we was backing Liberia up instead of looking at Liberia as a stranger? as looking at Liberia as something less than Kemet, less than Ethiopia, less than all these things that we, we view so grand, if we would take our talents and our money and what we have to offer and bring it the, there and work with our people, our own relatives, what we could do, because that's moving in the, in the right direction. Because if you educate your people, you can only get you can only become better. Your people are ignorant people, are illiterate people is not good for a nation. So here, Liberia is offering education for free. It can only make his country better, producing more doctors and nurses and lawyers and scientists and all these different things. And of course, because this education was given to them by their nation, they want to give back. 
we and the nation of Liberia will make a great team, I believe. And, and clearly that is on the agenda of OEM, Operation Exodus Mississippi, if we are able to, or when we are able to get to that, that point. We do need to reach out to Africa. We need to reach out to anybody that will be beneficial to us. Not because it's cool to be with them. If you don't offer any benefit, then you, know, you just want to do something because it looks good or sounds good. I'm not interested in that. We are trying to survive in this world of racism. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to, to survive. We're trying to not go extinct. We're trying to avoid future suffering and oppression. But again, congratulations and more power to the country, the nation of Liberia and President George Way, we away, for taking that. That's a that's a real good step because it can only make your country and your nation better. So, I wanna talk about this main topic. And the main topic really is, Young Pharaoh was saying something to the effect that the nation of Islam have a, a hate for uh, African beauty. Well, in that conversation, of course, it could not be avoided. Somebody got to talk about Louis Farrakhan. Did Louis Farrakhan participate in the murder of Malcolm X? So I'm, wanna, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. It's redundant. In fact, the whole, this whole topic is really redundant. <laughs> so... Um, Hey, good brother Steve, what's up? What's up? What's up? But I'm going to talk about it a little bit. So maybe we don't have to talk about it so much in the new year. Maybe in the new year, 2019, we could talk about new things, real things. So, of course, Louis Farrakhan's name is, is, is brought up. And the thing about Louis Farrakhan, the thing about Marcus Garvey and Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm and Dr. King and, and, and the list goes on and on. We are, for many of us, we become obsessed with individuals. We think that Louis Farrakhan or any of these persons that we admire, we think that their doo-doo don't stink. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, this is what I would like for people to see. Because y'all look at Jay-Z and Beyonce, all these celebrities, Louis Farrakhan, and for some reason, you think they are not human beings. You think they don't cry. You think they don't eat? I mean, you know it, but really you, you, you look at them as more than human beings. Yes, you do. They can't do no wrong. There's nothing that Beyonce can do or her fans. Go Beyonce, go Beyonce. They don't care. Same thing with poor Michael Jackson. He can't do nothing wrong. But see, this is, this is, you need a reality check. And I wish, <laughs> you know, I wish you could have a chance for some of you. And I remember uh, Richard Pryor was talking about this. Richard Pryor said that uh, one day he went to a public, uh, you know, to a public bathroom, you know, took a dump. Richard Pryor. And, you know, he came out, washed, was washing his hand. And, you know, you got other people coming to use the public restroom. And somebody, when they come in the, in the bathroom, it's like, whoo, man, what that? 
And they noticed that it was Richard Pryor. They said, Richard Pryor, is that, did you just do this? God damn, man, you rotten. Woo, you, damn, you stank. Oh, God, man. You know? And Richard like, what the hell you expect? It's a damn bathroom, man. You know? <laughs> Y'all think that these people do do don't stink. But they do. Somebody was smelling rich and proud doo doo. <laughs> you know, they, they stink. Minister Farrakhan has to urinate. He, he has to urinate. He has to take a dump. He's not greater than you are. He's not smarter than you. He's a human being. Y'all taking this all out of proportion. There's nothing. You, you think that these people are so great. You are great in your own way, but you lower yourself and you think because somebody can talk or somebody can sing and dance, you think they better than you are. You make a mistake. I, I, I admire these ladies. They're not better than me. They can sing. They are not better than me. They're not greater than me. They go to the toilet. These ladies go on their, on their monthlies. They're women, they're human beings, they cry. They get sad. We talk about Malcolm X and we talk about Marcus Garvey and we talk about all these people, how you love them. But if you really love these people, if you actually knew these people, I guarantee you, a lot of you wouldn't even like them because they're human beings. And human beings have certain traits and stuff that other human beings might not like. But you, you say that because you don't have to worry about looking at Minister Farrakhan on the toilet. You know, can you imagine Minister Farrakhan on the toilet? You know, uh, you know, give him one of them big ones. You know, one of the ones that, that don't want to go. Like, ah, uh, woo, you finally get loose. Ooh, praise be. <laughs> you know, that type of thing. We need to start worshiping people. Stop thinking folks is better than you, smarter than you. If all of us come from the same God, what makes them better than you? Matter of fact, you need to have a, a talk with God and tell God, why are you, why are these people your favorites? Why are you choosing these people over me? We are all children of God. So whatever connection Farrakhan has to God, you should have it also. It's just like when your parents are giving out allowances, your parents should give allowances to all the children, not just one particular one. Well, you get the, you don't want to get the allowance. Well, what about me, daddy? Well, you know, what, what about me? I'm your son too. How come I can't get along? Now you know how you would feel in a situation like that if, if your parents chose your brother or sister, made them feel divine and special over you. So why would you allow your God to do the same thing? Oh, Jesus is special. Oh, Muhammad is special. Oh, Abraham and Isaac, all these folks are special. And when it comes to religious teaching, women, females really don't get no credit for nothing. You might hear about the prophet Ruth and, and the wives of some of these men, but you don't, you don't, uh, the women don't get any props. Women can't lead nothing because you're too stupid. That's, that's, what, that's what I guess. Women must be stupid. The reason why it's all about Jesus is because you're too stupid. So I got to put it all on Jesus. Even if Jesus has to die, I'd rather keep it with Jesus. All the gifts, all the power goes to Jesus. Even if Jesus has to die, then give it to you and you are alive. Ain't that something? So we really need to get up out of this crap that these people do do don't stink. Because believe me, if you go to the bathroom behind anybody, believe me, that do do it don't stink. <laughs> I bear witness. <laughs> don't go behind me. 
<laughs> I can't say this. It ain't, it ain't as bad as I don't. I, some folks, some folks is woo. What y'all been eating? Y'all need to pick, pick up that uh, book, How to Eat to Live, <laughs> by by Elijah Muhammad. Eat one meal a day. <laughs> oh wow. Okay. So uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, let me get through this through this here, y'all. All right, uh, are y'all all right? <laughs> okay. So before we actually talked about, before they actually talk about, or maybe this, I don't know, maybe this was part of the uh, chat room conversation. I think it was. It became part of the chat room situation. They always, somebody always got to bring up did Farrakhan murder uh, Malcolm X? Did he participate? This is this is uh, what I want to say simply. Look, this is the reality of it. Well, you know, Farrakhan never was charged with a crime. He didn't go to jail. There are many people in this country and around the world who get away with murder. Just because you don't go to jail, just because you didn't get charged with a crime, don't mean that you did not commit the murder. That's just the bottom line. The possibility that you really, that you've done it is there. There's a possibility that Louis Farrakhan, if he did not directly participate, he knew about the murder of Malcolm X based on these reasons. Out of his mouth, Mr. Farrakhan said, well, you know, if somebody attacked what you love, it'll make you kill. That's what he said. If somebody attacked, which he felt as though Malcolm was attacking Elijah Muhammad, Elijah Muhammad is who he loved, then it, it gets to the point where I might have to kill you. Mind you, even Malcolm X, look, even Malcolm X said, he said, if somebody done what he had done, he probably would have be thinking the same way. He would want to kill too. It goes back to this religious zealot mindset. So Malcolm was didn't have his, he wasn't together either, but he just told you. And see, that's the reason why Malcolm knew that those guys was going to murder him because he understood that mindset because he was thinking the same kind of way. You messing with somebody I love. You keep it up. I'm going to kill you. So Farrakhan said that. Farrakhan praised. He called, he called the killers of Malcolm X heroes. He praised the murderers. He said that the followers of Malcolm X was coward. They laid around and they let their leader get murdered and they was running around scared for their life. Well, I mean, these murderers have weapons and the people don't have any weapons. What do you expect? But anyway, Farrakhan called Malcolm X's followers a bunch of cowards. And the real cowards were these people who went into a ballroom to shoot down an unarmed man in front of his wife and his children. Those are the damn cowards. But he praised that those people. He praised them. They used the government for a scapegoat. Because as you know, according to the pro, the government is, has always messed with our us as a people, our leadership, and everything that we try to do. I can guarantee you, once Operation Exodus Mississippi begins to, to, to get in motion, they will come and do whatever they can to try to destroy that movement. Right now, a bunch of Negroes, jealous Negroes, would like to do that. So I don't have to wait for the government. I have Negroes trying to destroy 
uh, OEM before it, it can even get off the ground. I don't have to wait for the government. But they use the government as a scapegoat because the government is known for these things. However, there's no evidence to, to, to suggest, except maybe if the government did know, they said, hey, we don't care, kill them, kill the dude. But the government did not pull the trigger. The people from the Nation of Islam pulled the trigger. They done that. There's no doubt about that. These people were members of the Nation of Islam. 20 years later, after Malcolm's death, Farrakhan started attacking Malcolm X. The man is dead. He's gone to join the ancestors. Why are you attacking this man? That tells you something. You want to try to murder somebody and they're already gone. They're already gone. Syrian says Farrakhan is an elder now. How can he be judged on things which happened in his youth? There is no statute of limitations on murder. You was a youth for murder and you should be punished. I don't give a damn how elder. Yeah, you, you became an elder. You shouldn't be an elder. You should be locked up somewhere. You should be punished for what you've done. You took a man's life. You planned to take a man's life. And then you call this man your brother. And even after the man is dead, then 20 years later, you want to bring the man's name up and start slandering his name. I was there. I didn't even know who Malcolm X was until Farrakhan started talking about him. I'm like, who, who is this? Who is Malcolm X? And when Farrakhan was speaking about Malcolm, he's a hypocrite and a traitor. He deserved death. That's what I heard. The first time I ever known who Malcolm X was, that's what I heard. What kind of heart, what kind of mentality is that? Maybe that of a murderer? It just so happened on the day that Malcolm was murdered, it just so happened Farrakhan was in town. A whole lot of prominent leadership of the Nation of Islam, they was in town. It, that was just a coincidence, right? It's just, just a coincidence. They say that Louis Farrakhan's brother lived right across the street from Malcolm X. That don't sound that don't sound funny to, to, to y'all. So since Alvin, Alvin Farrakhan, who lived right across the street, they say, from Malcolm X, he could easily watch Malcolm's comings and goings and report it to those who wanted to murder him. There were other planned attempts on Malcolm X's life before they were successful in February of 1965. Louis Farrakhan said in a speech, so what if we did kill Malcolm? Basically, that's what he's saying. So what if we did kill him? He's our traitor. He's our Benedict Arnold. We are building a nation, and we you can't tell a nation how to deal with their traitors. Like we can't, you can't expect America, you can't tell America how to, to deal with their traitors. So if the government, so if the government murdered Malcolm, why would you say that? Don't tell you, stay out of your business. This is how we do deal with our trade. Why would you bring that up if, if uh, the government done it? Then they go on to say that one of Malcolm X's daughters don't believe that the nation of Islam had anything to do with the death of her father. How would she know? She was a baby. The only thing she know, she saw some men run up to the stage and they sh shot her father down in cold blood. That's all she really know. She have no idea of what was going on. She don't know. And all of Malcolm's family don't believe that. 
And according to the things that I've been given, Sister Betty believed that the nation of Islam murdered her husband. And the only reason why she came on a stage with that suspected killer was because her, her daughter was charged with a crime. It was really a frame up where her daughter was supposed to have been trying to pay somebody to murder Farrakhan. So he could have, Farrakhan could have made things real bad for sister uh, Betty's daughter. So she just went on to play the game to stay on his good side until, until uh, her daughter was out of that situation. Because he could have actually been really nasty about it and had her go to jail for the rest of her life over that. But he decided to use that situation and try to paint the picture like it's all good between Farrakhan and Sister Betty Shabazz, the Malcolm X family, which is a lie. It's an illusion. It's not true. To my knowledge, from what I was told, Sister Betty said that the Nation of Islam murdered her husband. You say that the government murdered Malcolm X, but the government had nothing to do with the Muhammad Speaks, a newspaper that was created by Malcolm X. There was a cartoon with Malcolm X's head rolling, cut his head off. The government did not do that. That was the Nation of Islam. Louis Farrakhan every week He's a man worthy of death, calling for the death of Malcolm X every week on the radio. Government don't have nothing to do with that. Mind you, prior to this conflict with the nation of Islam itself, there was no attempts, no assassination attempt on Malcolm X. There were the, Ku, the Ku Klux Klan did not call for Malcolm. The only one who called for Malcolm X's death was these Negroes. No, I, to my knowledge, there was no white folks running around, kill Malcolm X, death to Malcolm X. It was the nation of Islam. And it's funny, after they call for the death of Malcolm X, all of a sudden, he ends up dead. Oh, but the government did it. Oh, yeah, I, I know, the government did it. It was reported on his deathbed, Captain Yusuf Shaw, one of the top captains in the Nation of Islam, on his death pit, on his deathbed, it was reported that he said he was there when the Nation of Islam firebombed Malcolm X's house. And of course, within that same week, Malcolm was assassinated, he was murdered. But the government did. But the government did. So all you have all this stuff here, and you're going to tell me that Farrakhan is some innocent guy. No, people get away with murder all the time. And it's, e it's even easier to get away with murder when the government that you talk about done it is on your side. Yeah. Yeah. When the, all this list that I just said makes Louis Farrakhan suspect. He got him and a whole lot of other folks who planned this, they got away with murder because the government that you're talking about that actually did it was the one that backed you up because chances are they knew they had some informants and they knew what was going down, but they let y'all do it. They let you do it. So I hope that you're happy. And 10 years later, the nation of Islam went down to nothing and it's nothing right now. It's nothing. Murderers. In conclusion on this, on this particular topic, as far as did Louis Farrakhan have anything to do with Malcolm's murder? I want to, mind, I want to remind us 
that you have people that wasn't even born. Look, there's people that wasn't even born during the time of Malcolm X. They say they would kill Malcolm, but the government done it. The government. I don't. I, I haven't heard no report where the government said, "Yeah, uh, I wish we could have. We should have been able to kill Malcolm back in 1965." Only people living right now, when they hear Farrakhan and his hatred for Malcolm X, he's a traitor and he's a uh, Benedict Arnold. He's a hypocrite, and they follow his lead like they follow his lead in 1965 and inspired a bunch of naive young people to commit murder and the sad thing about it and i heard look and i heard farcon insinuate you know y'all lucky i look because he had farcon had got really really angry because so many people was talking about him and i remember one of his speeches i think the speech was over and but basically what he was saying was y'all lucky you know I love you because if I want, because if I wanted to, I could have you hurt. I could have you murdered. See, what, what is that telling us? What is that telling you? That there's a possibility that this man did conspire and participate in the murder of Malcolm X and he got away with murder. And the reason why he has been allowed to live to be elderly is because he's no threat to the government, but Malcolm X was. Right, that's right, uh, brother, brother Don. I heard that that a guy, Pharaoh, said that. Yes, that's right. I heard him say it. he would murder, he would have killed Malcolm X too. So that mentality is alive and well right here in 2018 going into 2019. There are those who would murder Malcolm X right now because of what Louis Farrakhan said. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a possibility that Farrakhan participated in the murder of Malcolm X. For all the reasons I said, and you can keep believing that he didn't all that you want to, the man seems like he got away with murder. That's what happened. But of course, like Denzel Washington say in Training Day, he said, uh, what did he say in Training Day? Oh yeah, uh, uh, damn, what, I just had it on my mind. What did D Denzel Washington say? Uh, and training day. Man, I just had it on my mind. I say it all the time. I lost. He said in training day, it, something about if you can't prove it, you know, if you can't prove it, don't mean nothing. Um, I say it all the time. Getting seen all y'all. It's, it's bad getting old. <laughs> I just talking too fast. I had that. I had that thought on my mind. I say it all the time from, from Denzel Washington training day. Oh, it's not about what you know. It's about what you can prove. That's what Denzel Washington said in training day. It's not about what we know. It's not about what we suspect. It's about what we can prove. So since you can't prove Farrakhan did anything, well, the only thing you can think, well, he got away with murder. He's not the first person that got away with murder. Won't be the last. George Zimmerman, they, somebody said in the chat room, George Zimmerman got away with murder. So, hey. With that redundant topic, topic over, we want to go ahead and get into the last of this. And the question that has been raised is, does the nation of Islam have a hatred for African beauty? We want to see. Give me a second. I just wanted to check my Facebook real quick. Um, Syrian says that Farrakhan has apologized and acknowledged his mistakes. It's time to let this go. Farrakhan has not apologized. Let's, let's make that perfectly clear. 
The only thing Farrakhan did was basically say, acknowledge his so-called his mistakes. He did not apologize. I did not hear him say, I am sorry for what happened. I do not hear the word. If you can put the, put the video link in the chat room and show me where he said, I apologize for what happened. He did not say that. The only thing I heard him say was, yeah, I know I, I hyped some people up and that's all I heard him say. That's all he said. He did not apologize for nothing. A murderer ain't gonna, ain't gonna apologize for something they, they, they done and was proud of it. He praised the killers. He was happy about Malcolm's murder. He's not gonna apologize. To apologize means that he must confess and admit that Elijah Muhammad was wrong. So where's the video that showed where Farrakhan said, you know, that should never happen. Elijah Muhammad was wrong. I want to see that video. He has not apologized for nothing. Farrakhan stepped back from the Malcolm thing because he could not destroy Malcolm's legacy. That's the reason why. He tried to destroy Malcolm, Malcolm's legacy. But people could see how sincere Malcolm was, how honest he was, how clean cut. He was a beautiful looking human being. He could not destroy that. So now Farrakhan trying to get on the train because he can't convince the people to hate Malcolm. If he was able to get the people to hate Malcolm, it'll be a whole new ball game. It is not time to let it go. You don't let no murderer live in peace. You, you have to let them, you have to let them know, we know that you are a murderer. Farrakhan is not going to have the legacy that Malcolm X had. Farrakhan is full of doo-doo. You keep believing that crap. He's full of doo-doo. He does not act like somebody who, sh who shows remorse. Because if Farrakhan really felt that way about Malcolm, then why would you bring his name up 20 years later? You would say to the public, I'm, I'm not going to answer any questions or make any reference to Malcolm X. That's a very hurtful part of my life. That was a very hurtful part of the Nation of Islam's history. I don't want to talk about that at all. That's not what he done. Malcolm is a traitor. He's a hypocrite and all that other stuff. Then with, in his arrogance, he turns around to talk about, well, the reason why Malcolm X died so I can live. The reason why I have lived as long as I did because I learned the lesson that Malcolm X failed to learn. So Malcolm X died so I can live. No, no, sir. Malcolm X died because he got shot with a shotgun. He did not die because so that you could live. That's not the reason why. How arrogant you are. So. So since Malcolm X died so that you can live, sir, then what have you done greater than Malcolm X? What have you done greater and better? Nothing. You call two million men to Washington to march and accomplish what? Nothing. Three, your three-year, five-year economic program that you started way back in 1991 what has it done? Nothing. Your fish program, nothing. Your clean and fresh products, nothing. Everything that you touch is you a loser. You a loser. The only thing you know how to do is hype people up. And they are satisfied with hype. And if you're satisfied with having nothing but some hype, so be it. But you're not Malcolm X, sir. And he died because he got shot, not so that you could live. Live to do what? To do nothing. 40 years of nothing. Somebody told me, 
Farrakhan has this, Farrakhan has that. That's just like asking me, we having a party and you give me a hundred dollars to go get supplies for our party and I bring you back a bag of Snicker bars for $6. So what happened to the other $94? What happened to the other $94? Yeah, I, I, I got something for the party, a bag of Snicker bar. But what about the other $94? And that's that's the case of Farrakhan. He give you a little something, something. But compared to the millions and millions of dollars this man has had to go through his hands within the last 40 years, he has nothing. Nothing. The Nation of Islam should have their own YouTube, their own Facebook. Millions and millions of acres of land, farming and businesses, they don't have nothing. Nothing. The least you could do is invest in real estate so your followers can have places to live because they, they have to pay rent anyway. Buy buildings so your people can have a place to live. Don't even have that, don't have nothing. Nothing. He did not try. That's not a try. Because he's not a leader. Malcolm X was a leader. He was creative. He had vision. Farrakhan is a follower. He's a follower. Malcolm X was a leader. He thought for himself. Elijah Muhammad did not have to guide him. He just did things. And Elijah Muhammad just let Malcolm do what he wanted to do because he could see that. He was a visionary. He was creative. He was a leader. Farrakhan is not a leader. He's a follower. He needs somebody to guide him. He can inspire you. He can inspire you. And he can hype you up to make you want to do something. But he don't know what to do. 40 years of not knowing what to do. That's all it was. So Malcolm X is the one that put the nation of Islam on the map. It was not Elijah Muhammad. Malcolm X was the one that put the nation of Islam on the map. Sister Betty said when Malcolm joined the nation of Islam, it was nothing but a bunch of old people on crutches, basically. They weren't doing nothing. Nothing was going happening. It was Malcolm's energy that put the nation of Islam on the map. Elijah Muhammad probably asked Allah, when will my help come? And so Allah bless you with Malcolm X. I wish I could have me a Malcolm X. No offense to you, brother Talib. <laughs> Allah bless you with Malcolm X. Then you turn around and kill the blessing. Then you turn around and y'all say that the black man is God. The nation of Islam teaches the black man is God. And then you sit around and you sit in some seats with your shotguns and your pistols and God is getting ready to talk. And before God can talk, you blow his brains out. Well, you shoot him in the chest in front of his wife and his children. The black man is God. Even in modern times, me, myself, I have been threatened at least two times by these, by these cowards, religious zealot cowards. They will kill and murder black folks, soul brothers and sisters. They will do that. But you never hear about them attacking racists, never, unless it's in self-defense. They never go out and intentionally hunt down racists, even the ones that murdered them. Malcolm X, during his time, wanted to take revenge when they murdered Nation of Islam members. Elijah Muhammad said, no, we can't, no, don't, don't do, we can't, no, we can't retaliate. Malcolm X wanted to get revenge. What does it, but Elijah Muhammad 
didn't have no problem when he knew that these people was planning if he himself didn't know or had, had, had knowledge that they were going to try to murder Malcolm. When it comes to Caucasian people of these races, let God handle it. But when it comes to us, go get your gun, go get your pistol. Mind you that the Nation of Islam says that they are not supposed to carry as much as a pen knife. Let God handle it. God will protect them. But in the case of Malcolm, they went out and got pistols and shotguns and killed this man. And Farrakhan praised, praised the murderers Praise the killers, try to destroy this man's legacy. We supposed to sit back in the cut and just let him do that to a good person. No, Malcolm X is not perfect. I'm very sure. No, I know he's not perfect. He did not deserve to be shot down in front of his wife and children. That we know. He did not. And I want you to bring it to me. And I want you to bring it to me. You justify this man done something so horrible that he deserved to be shot down in front of his wife and his children. Y'all some old nasty, raggedy dogs. You'll never be successful. You'll never. And as soon as Louis Farrakhan passed his life, It'll be over for Nation of Islam crap. It'll be the end of it. You'll go, um, you'll go into almost nothingness. Because as soon as Louis Farrakhan passed, then the infighting will start. And the whole thing gonna fall apart like it usually do. And because of your hatred for Malcolm, for your hatred really of God, period, you deserve to be gone. Bye-bye. So, Brother Ben X, you wasting your time. Brother Ben X, you wasting your time. I'm telling Brother Ben X that that's a sign that it's time for you to leave that stuff alone. You are better than the nation of Islam. It's a sign from God. It's time for you to get out. Now, okay, hold on a second here. Okay, look. Yeah, so uh, the only thing we can do is learn from the mistakes of the past. Because I'm very sure when Operation Exodus Mississippi gets larger and becomes more, I have to face, I'm dealing with it already. These different personalities and you don't know where people come from and things of this nature. And you will have per people who will want to murder you. Jealousy and envy. It's already happening. Don't even have don't even have OEM off the ground good. It's already happening. Jealousy, envy. Let's deal with this young Pharaoh accusation. And why does young Pharaoh? Why does young Pharaoh bring this up? Because he heard a video where Louis Farrakhan was speaking and Louis Farrakhan basically was bragging about having straight, straight hair. Straight hair is good hair. Now, before I came on air, I know the story. I forgot exactly what book that was in. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure it's, it's in Message to the Black Man of America. I'm not sure. I, I try to look it up. I haven't you know, I, I don't deal with religion and, and stuff like that no more like I used to. So I forgot exactly where it's at. But this story that Minister Farrakhan is saying is nothing but textbook Nation of Islam teaching. 
is textbook. There was a scientist, I believe he's a scientist, last name Shabazz, and prior, and prior to, to what he done, our hair, or the hair of dark-skinned people, was just like our eyebrows. It was not kinky. I forgot the reason why he wanted to, he wanted to separate. I, I forgot what the reason was. Anyway, he ended up going, this Shabazz guy. Started this tribe with Shabbat. That's why they call it the tribe of Shabazz. And went down into the jungles. And of course, living a, a, a harsher lifestyle, it, it kinked your hair up. And uh, basically, basically, this is a, a sign of rebellion because he was, he was, Shabazz was rebellious against the rest of. Black society or whatever. He became a rebel. So they said like it's like a rebellion against God. And those who are rebel rebels against God, they begin they begin their, as Farrakhan explained it, you begin to take on mutilated features. Look. <laughs> mutilated features. He said that prior to Shabazz, our hair was straight. We had thin lips and we had more narrow noses. That's what that's what the teachings say. That sounds like white folks with a tan, don't it? That's what it sounds like. It sounds like these original black folks was nothing but they was they look like Caucasian people with dark skin. That's what it sounds like. And then when they re rebel. And went down into this jungle situation and, and, and basically rebelled against God, then your features became mutilated. Your, your, your lips got fat, your nose got big, your hair kinked all up. I guess your skin got a little darker too. Hmm. But that's the teaching, that's textbook. And Brother Ben fired back because what they're trying to say is that. Malcolm was different. And they always show a clip where Malcolm was talking about be proud of your, your features, your dark skin and your big nose, kinky hair, and blah, blah, blah. But then, kudos to Brother Ben, he showed an audio where Malcolm X was basically saying the same thing that Farrakhan was saying. That's the teachings. That's, that's textbook Nation of Islam teaching that tribe of Shabazz story. So, so you can't condemn Farrakhan and let Malcolm off the hook because they got it from the same place. That's textbook Nation of Islam teachings. Now, mind you, <clears throat> there's no evidence a tribe of Shabazz ever existed. Show me any type of archaeological evidence of a tribe of Shabazz. And then, of course, they said this happened uh, 50,000 years. I forgot what the exact time was. It was a long time ago. But anyway, show us the evidence of the existence of this tribe of Shabazz. In fact, I was told that Shabazz is not even an Arabic name. It's a, it's, a, it's a Pakistani name. Those who are associated with those living in Pakistan. It's not even Arab. But even so, when, we, when you look at our hair, we have hair all over our body. We grow it all over our face. It's all over our hair. We, get, we have hair all over our bodies. So the, the hair that's on our bodies is not like on our eyebrow or in our nose, our underarm. And I'm not, look, I don't want to be nasty or nothing, but your, you know, your private part hair, hairs, is different than what's on your head and everywhere else. Hair is different all over your body. We are hairy. 
But for some reason, within human evolution, it came to the point we don't we don't need hair like that anymore. See, we think that we are really above animals, but we have ha hairs all over our body. And some of us can get really hairy. We have hair all over our body. You have hair in your ears. You have hair in your nose. Eyebrows. You have hair everywhere, a little bit everywhere. On your, on your booty. <laughs> some of y'all got, got a hairy booty. You know it. Some of y'all got to shave your booty. <laughs> you got you to gotta shave your face. Cut your hair and, and, and shave your booty. <laughs> we we have hair everywhere. The, re the reason why there's different kinds of hair is according to how that creature, that speak, that, that 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 life form, how you evolve. Everybody, all life forms evolve differently. So you can have blackbirds, but the blackbirds, all these blackbirds. The reason why they are what they are is because they evolve differently. They evolve differently, so you got a different result. That's the reason why. And of course, they, they say in biology, if you take a people that was living in, 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 uh, in Africa and you slowly move them to a colder climate, they're going to change because they're moving from a place from a from a, a, a warm place to a colder place, so they're gonna begin to change. Has nothing to do with no curse. Has nothing to do with good, good and bad hair. Has nothing to do with that. Matter of fact, in a lot of cases, as far as the hair on your head is concerned, after a certain period of time, some of us, like myself, you start going bald. Your hair start falling out. Not only men, but women too. Your hair start falling out. So you don't have to worry about straight hair or kinky hair because all of it's going to fall out anyway. So what do that mean? And then as we grow older, some of y'all older folks, the men, you, you start growing hair all on your ears, on top of your nose. You start getting hair in places that you never had hair before when you start growing older. And for some of you women, what do it mean? What do it mean? Because some of y'all, when you get older, you start getting hair on your chin. You know, y'all start getting hair. You know, it's because of a, when, when women get older, it's because you have an imbalance in your, in your chemical makeup. You start to get more uh, testosterone, you know, instead of estrogen. And so you start getting a little, little beard on you and stuff, whatever. <laughs> what do that mean? See, we got to stop tripping off this religious stuff because it don't mean nothing. It's just biology. We are what we are because of how we were, how we were evolved. It has nothing to do with a curse from God and all this other nonsense that these people are talking about. Now, there are contradictions in the Nation of Islam teaching because the Nation of Islam do teach this story. But at the same time, they'll turn around and tell you to be proud of your African self and be proud of your big nose and thick lips and kinky hair and whatever. I mean, which one is it, sir? You're telling me that it was... Farrakhan said in his speech that it was a sign of rebellion against God that you got kinky hair, thick lips, and broad nose, and all that type of stuff. But then you turn around, and then you say, be proud. So are you saying be proud of your rebellion? I mean, see, it's contradictory. That's the way religion is. Religion gets you all caught up and confused, but yet it's still Allah is not supposed to be the author of confusion. <laughs> But this whole thing is awfully confusing because you you telling me a story that make me feel as though having kinky hair and and real dark skin, broad nose, thick lips, that that's rebellion is against God. Then you turn around and tell me we're supposed to be proud of it. Which one is it, sir? Mind you, you see why the nation of Islam 
has a sort of love toward straight hair, thinner lips, thinner noses. The more Caucasian that you look, the better, because their God is biracial. For Muhammad, their God, mother was a Caucasian woman, father was a black man, which produced this white looking man, a white man, Caucasian looking guy. That's their God. So who wouldn't want to look like God? So, so what are you, why are you talking all this other, be proud of your dark skin and your black, when you, when you, when you really don't believe that. And if you look at the leadership, and if you look at the leadership of the nation of Islam, all the big shot positions or whatever, most of the time, it's always a light skinned brother or sister. Never dark, never dark skinned person with kinky hair, broad nose and thick lips. It's always light skinned person. They might have thick lips and broad nose, but they always, always light skinned with straight hair. Look at Farrakhan, light skinned man. And he got his hair conked. And he dyes hair black because he's ashamed to be old. Scared to show his gray like, like I'm showing my gray. Shame. Shame that he's he's grown old, can't do what he used to do. So I'm gonna color up my gray and I'm gonna cut my hair. But he's gonna tell you, be proud of your kinky hair. But he's not proud of his kinky hair. Farrakhan himself suffers from self-hatred. And why would you suffer from self-hatred? Probably because you serve a God that's biracial. And in this society, the, the symbol of beauty is Caucasian women, Caucasian beauty. Why did, why did Master Farah Muhammad have to have a Caucasian mother when we know that this black woman, this African woman, this soul woman, she can produce all the colors of the rainbow. I just saw a picture on a, on a, on a Facebook post. It was a sister and she had, she had children from the very, from the very light. Matter of fact, she had an albino child all the way to the very dark. It came from this one mother. So how come Master Farah Muhammad, how come his mother, why was a white woman, an actual Caucasian woman chosen for that job to be the mother of God? It's questions. I want to, it's questions. Why is your leadership, all the, all the ministers and all these people, why are they always light-skinned folks? Are you trying to say, are, are, are people that's dark-skinned like myself, are we dumb and stupid? We don't know the teachings? What Eric Muhammad said, talk black to me. I'm talking to you too, Eric, because y'all, you the nation of Islam too. Talk black to me. Why was a Caucasian woman chosen to birth God? And then it is suggested that the reason why many of us, we want to straighten our hair and wear weaves, you know, straight hair, is because since straight hair is really is natural for us, that's us trying to go back to our natural self. No, 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 that's not. The reason why we do it is because we live in a racist society and that. And that, again, Caucasian beauty, we have been influenced by Caucasian beauty. And it's not just us. When you go to Asia or some of these other countries, you see them bleaching their skin, straightening their hair, and doing a whole lot of other stuff. Because of, the, of Caucasian influence in the world, the white woman or Caucasian or being a European, that's the sign of beauty. It's not because we're trying to go back to our original self. We never was that anyway. We're not original people anyway. Those of us born in America, 
descendants of slaves. We're not that anyway. So there's contradictions here. And there's self-hate issues in, in, the, in the nation of Islam. There's self-hate issues here. Clearly, there's confusion and contradictory. That's why I tell us we need to let go of all religious rhetoric. You need to let it all go. It's not based on logic or reason or reality. This story about some guy, some guy in Shaba scientist, there's no evidence that ever happened. There's no evidence. The Nation of Islam teach that the black man has been here, what, for 666 trillion years, 66 trillion years or something like that. Where's your evidence? What's up, Alquan? What's up? What's, what's happening? There's no evidence to that. There's no evidence that we existed 6,600. The best scientists can say, the best scientists can say is that the earth is a few billion years old, let alone where would, if, if, if black folks existed trillions of years ago, you wasn't on the planet earth. So where the hell was we? We need to stop this stuff. But I tell you this, you are my brother, you are my sister, and I can work with you. I can work with you, but y'all need to learn how to separate your personal beliefs with what we have to actually do. That's the problem. When your beliefs keep us from unification, which is the only thing that can get us out of our situation, I got a problem with that. So if I have to attack your belief system, your religion, then I got to do that. Brother Don said a young pharaoh have a video saying that black folks have been on around since 776 trillion years. <laughs> really? And see, this is, this is the sad thing about it. You've been on the planet that long, and then somebody come out of a cave 6,000 years ago. You've been around for trillions of years, and somebody come out of a cave. 6,000 years ago and whoop your ass and destroy everything you've done out of, the, out of the trillions of years that you've been existing. That shows that you're really, really pathetic. <laughs> you know what I mean? For real. That shows really you are really pathetic. <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to talk with us. I guess I did wake up a little bit. I really was sleeping. <laughs> I really was sleepy, but you know. Uh, but I woke up. Uh, thanks for those of you who are in the that's that's watching, those in the in the uh chat room. I want to say um send a shout out to Alquan. Alquan is in the uh chat room, and you know, Alquan, I'm gonna tell you, it don't make no difference. You know, we have our difference or, or whatever. Believe me. You know, the thing, a lot of things that you bring or whatever, you know, I, you know, we down. We really on the same team. You know, we should not allow these little differences or whatever, because I'm against the, the, these fake, wacky folks just like you are. You know, I, I enjoy your work. Um, <laughs> they brag about the pyramids. Hey, Armin. <laughs> Always bragging about some old dead stuff. If you come to this platform, the only thing I want to talk about is what we're going to do. Only thing I want to do is, is talk about the new. That's all I want to talk about. You know, it's nice talking about the old, but there's nothing like building something with your own hands that you do. That's what they done. I want to do something myself. I got a brain. I have hands myself. I can do some building myself, unless y'all ain't smart enough. You mean to tell me you've been here for trillions of years and you, you can't do no better than what we're doing right now? <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, so, you know, I just, I just wanted to bring that to our attention. Like I said, this, this topic, this topic has really uh, become redundant and I hope not to revisit it anymore. I don't want to re uh, revisit it no more because it's, it's really redundant. You keep rehashing and saying the same old stuff over and over again. And we need to go on and do something new. Like your scriptures say, for those of you who believe in scriptures, you know, make things new. Behold, I make all things new. And the former things shall pass away. This does not mean that we can't remember grandmother and grandfather. But it means we have to live our own lives. And we have to create a new reality for ourselves and make things that's new for us. They did what they did for themselves. Okay, okay, uh, Aquan. <clears throat> but uh, we have to do things for ourselves. For us. And I'm just like many of you. My love begins with the brothers and sisters of soul, the descendants of slaves, born in America. You are my top priority. We should be our top priority. I can't worry about Africa and other places when you can't even take care of yourself. We have to take care of ourselves first. That's the first law of survival. Deal with yourself first. How can I feed somebody else when I can't feed myself? Don't make any sense. Do it. But with that said, y'all, let's promote OEM, Operation Exodus Mississippi. Let's talk about it. Whether it's bad or good talk, let's get the conversation. Challenge your big YouTubers to talk about it. And let's get the conversation started. Our people cannot make a choice about something they don't know nothing about. So it's our responsibility to put it out there, start the conversation. And let's get this ball rolling. I guarantee you, we get this train to going and the sky's the limit. You'll be so shocked. You're like, wow, we could have done this a long time ago. In fact, if it was not for the, <laughs> in fact, if it wasn't for, for the, uh, for domestic terrorism, our people would have done it a long time ago. Our ancestors was already on the, on their way to control states like Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia, where we had a huge population. It was the races, you know, Tennessee. It's the races that caused them to flee for their lives. They was already doing it. So the only thing we're doing is something that they that should have been done a long, long time ago. That's all. So let's 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 do that. Uh again, subscribe to Brother Talib. His channel is in the information box. Subscribe to Sister Noble. Her information is in the description box. Let us subscribe to one another. Let us support one another. I don't care if you're Muslim or agnostic or atheist, wherever you are. I'm your brother. I'm with you. That's why I'm still reaching out to my brother, Alquan. And we go back and forth, but he that's, that's my brother. We're going to work this out. That's how family do as long and you can do that when you're sincere but if you're not sincere you can't reach out and touch another person like that because you got you got you got you got something to, uh you got something you got another agenda and also it's not in, in the subscription box but subscribe to alquan too a l q u a n subscribe to alquan um like i say we have our back and forth or whatever, but I mean, this is family. We expect that, but family gonna work it out because we want, we are sincere about, we are sincere in about changing the condition of this people. Yeah, um, yeah, Alquan, what did you, what did you wanna say? You wanna say something before I get out of here? Cause I'm getting ready to roll here. Uh, is a uh, talk real solutions is, is off the air? 
I didn't know that. I need to call, I'm gonna call Tyrone and see what's, what's up with that. Cause I, I noticed uh, ain't too much going on. He probably got tired of paying and you know those guys uh, use that, uh, that uh, blog talk radio and nobody was really donating, you know, to keep that going. Yeah, brother Tyrone probably is uh, tired of us uh, um, spending his own money for TRS. Yeah, yeah, that's it. They won't donate. They won't donate to help the man. I even donated to TRS, and I don't even I don't you know I, I will come on there now and then, but you have all those guys that want to run their mouth and they wasn't sending Tyrone nothing. Actually, TRS was a good good. Uh, a good program, really. They was he was doing pretty good, but that's all you know. Niggas just want they want things for free. Yeah, he probably. Uh, I know that he got he just he just got tired of those guys wasn't serious because the purpose of talk real solutions was to talk about real solutions, and they wouldn't never they wouldn't stay on point. So he just. It just became entertainment. So I guess it's gotten to the point where he just, he just tired. He just tired. Uh, but anyway, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna reach out to uh, Brother Tyrone, and maybe I can get him to come this way, because <laughs> I know he's very sincere and want to change the condition of our people. He would be a a, a very very uh, wonderful asset to the to the struggle, no doubt. So with that said, y'all, <laughs> peace to Aquan, peace to all those in the chat room, Syrian, and let me look, let me see who everybody is there. I want to send a shout out. Uh, is it Diamond Pier Almond, Almond, and, and Good Brother Steve and Don, and all those. If I miss somebody in the chat room, um, those who are in my Facebook, Samuel Cass. Thank you for joining me. I was sleepy, but I woken up and I hope that I offered us something that we can think about and and uh so that we can move forward. And until next time, if uh you know tomorrow is not promised to nobody, but if if uh if if I am, as they say religion, blessed to see a new year. I hope to see you next year. And like I said, this time next year, I hope to bring something, a good report as far as the progress of OEM. So with that said, as important as Dr. Cornelius always told us, I wish us love, peace, and so check y'all out later. I'm Audi 5000.